Uh, my name is Jörg Konrad. Um, you see, um, I'm running a lab on neurocomputing systems. I very recently moved uh, to KTH in Stockholm. Uh, before that, I was an assistant professor here at TUM, so this is being back home. Uh, most of the work you see has been done by the group of people mentioned upstairs. They're all around here somewhere, so if you go out, um, be nice to them. If you come to Stockholm, you will probably find me. So my interest is in uh, neural computing for real-time systems, so to apply neural computing in technology, in applicable systems, in, in robots, basically, or in any other engineered systems. Um, this is a slide I usually um, build up slowly over many, many steps and iterations to explain to my computer science technical audience the difference between brains on the left side and machines on the right side, how systems compute. And you, your background is very diverse. When I saw the, the list of participants, I was, oh, oh goodness, this is people from you know, theoretical computer science all the way to medical uh, neuroscience. So it's very hard to, to reach out to all of you. But at least if you look at the left side and the right side, you see there are fundamental differences in how brains and how computers compute. And of course, today we address spiking systems. So we are somewhere in between these. We, we look at how brains compute, but we want to implement this. We want to instantiate spiking computation in technology. So that's the right side. And of course, there's mismatch. So the left side, the brain is unreliable. We've heard this today. It is vastly, is massively parallel. The typical computer is designed to be guaranteed correct. We have, we're reaching voltage levels. We, we balance out so that we have no noise in our systems. Um, it's inherently non-parallel. It's typically one CPU. Now, if you buy a modern laptop, you probably have like four or eight cores. That is a very different number to those you know, 100 billion neurons we have in our brain. It's eight cores. So yes, you can run you know, your PowerPoint and your web browser in parallel, but you can't run neural networks efficiently in parallel. And that's what we will look at. There's a diagram of neuron count. Again, Rudiger has had a very similar diagram. Oh, he had individual hotspots of this diagram. I want to point your attention to the very left end of this to motivate why I care about neural networks and particularly spiking neural networks for robots. On the left end, you see there is an animal, the sponge. It has very few neurons. It's not zero. When it's born, it has 10, 12, 15 neurons. It happily lives its life in the ocean and hunts for food. It looks actively for things it can eat. But at some point in its life, the sponge decides to attach to a rock and never let go from that rock. It sticks to that rock for the rest of its life. And the next thing the sponge does is it eats up its own brain. So it digests its neurons. Now that is a very smart thing to do because neurons are very nutritious, lots of energy stored inside the neurons. But that's also a very stupid thing to do because when you eat up your own brain, then what do you do afterwards? I heard some, well, you heard it already last week. So, so I heard some answers. I, I'm not quite sure what I heard. The true answer is you just stick at that rock and you don't move anymore. You, you turn from an active entity into a passive entity. You sit there and wait for your food to happen to swim through you. And whatever happens to swim through you, you can digest and eat. So some of my students have compared this uh, with professors who get a permanent job at a university. So that I don't really want to elaborate on anymore. But it's clear that this, as a demonstration, shows that the brain has evolved to actively interact in environments. That's what it's useful for. It's not to process images. It's not to, to do number crunching. It's not to do abstract reasoning. The brain has evolved to process sensory input in real time and generate motor output. That's all what the brain is good for. And that's why I care about neural computing for real-time, real-world systems. I, that's why I care about the combination of brain computing and robots. And that's what we do in my lab. So we have a bunch of uh, robots. They are much simpler robots than most of the amazing tools that uh, Professor Dillmann has shown in the previous slides. We have a very simple mobile arm robots. We have very simple wheeled robots. We have some flying robots. And I will discuss a few of these robotic systems and give some motivation of how we apply neural technology, neural computing, to have them operate. There are four main research directions in, in our lab, and today I will talk about event-based neuromorphic vision and neuromorphic real-time computing and control as two examples to highlight benefits of neural-inspired computing. 
So I hope I've, I've all picked you up and explained why I think brains are the best thing for robots, just with a sponge example. And now I'll get, get through some examples of what we've been working on. Again, you've seen examples of event-based vision in the previous talk. Um, who, has, who has seen event-based vision before, cameras of event-based vision? That's just very few. So I'll, I'll try to pick you up then a little earlier than I think uh, uh, what Rüdiger did. So if you think of our eyes in our heads, most people tend to think they work like cameras. They take images and give these images to the brain. But that's clearly not true. I mean, we are all interested in neuroscience. We know they provide spikes. Um, and what really happens is that the brain then reconstructs this stream of spikes into our understanding of the world. So we reconstruct what we perceive, what I see, that my whole reasoning of the world is not because I have a camera in my head and get an image of this lecture room, but instead I get notifications of changes, spikes into the brain, and then the brain rebuilds the, the true world in my perception. Now, these cameras have been developed in Zurich in a research group led by Professor Delbrück. Um, it's an event-based vision sensor, and you see the working principle in the video. On the left side, you see my hand moving up and down in front of some background. On the right side, you see green and red dots lighting up wherever there is a change of brightness in a, a particular position in the world. So when the camera observes a change of brightness, it emits a spike, just saying, now it's brighter, now it's darker. You see there's some background noise. There's no static notion of the black or white background just where things happen. It's not a motion camera. It's a brightness change camera. It's a temporal brightness sensitivity. So this is a different way of representing visual information. It has some advantages. For example, we're getting a sparse data stream. It's much less data than consecutive images. We're having a very low response time. So when things move or when a light is switched on within a few microseconds, we can observe that and we can respond. So that's the temporal coding that uh, Professor Maas has mentioned earlier, first spike to activity, we could employ here. We don't have to wait uh, tens of milliseconds until the next image comes in. And this camera, because it's all local individual pixels, has very high contrast sensitivity on the order of 120 uh, decibel dynamic range. So we can work simultaneously in dark areas, such as in a tunnel, when a car goes into a tunnel, and in bright sunlight. OK, now that's just a different data format, a spiking data format. And again, to highlight the differences, on the left, you're seeing a video reconstruction of the camera moving inside my office. This is not the video we're getting out of the camera. What we're getting out of the camera, shown on the right side, we're getting a sequence of individual events, x coordinate, y coordinate, and polarity, so where in an image things happen. And then we can use that to reconstruct this into a video so that we humans can see what's going on. But really, in our computer, we're getting individual spikes, we're getting events, and have to operate on those. Now, this is very far away from neuroscience biology, but this is a technical implementation of a fundamental principle of neuroscience, of spikes as propagating information. And it's very efficient in many ways. I'll show you some examples. Before that, if you're interested in these systems, you can go to different companies. For example, um, Innovation in Zurich, which is a spin-off of the group that produced, that developed these cameras. You can buy various models of these cameras. Now, the, the, the common feature is they all come with a USB cable, and you have to plug this USB cable into your computer, and you can process the arriving data inside the computer. That's really not handy for any mobile, small robotic setup. So what we've developed years ago is embedded versions. So we've taken the same chip, the same sensor front end, and integrated this on some electric circuitry so that we can do processing right at the sensor front end inside microcontrollers. So we can run simple vision algorithms in real time on board. There's a, a general purpose generic version at the bottom, which is bigger, has plenty of connectors, so you can connect a robot right there on the, on the ports. There is an optimized, uh, in terms of size and weight version, at the top. These are used mainly for flying robots or small robotic systems where weight really matters. We've run a lot of student projects, which you see here. So it's all from robotics line following or chasing each other. So this is all um, vision systems computing on board that you see here. We've done balancing projects uh, with, a, with a small cart that moves left, right, up front to balance a pan, a very small object with a high 
uh, uh, with low inertia, and therefore uh, it's, it tends to fall off very fast. Uh, we've done high-speed tracking, as shown on the bottom left. We've done some ocular motor control, everything on board of these sensors. Several projects are very similar to what Rüdiger has done. Um, these are the fun projects we do typically as, as student projects in our lab. We're not earning um, any money or much scientific fame with these. Then where we see applications, where we go from spiking networks or rather spiking data input to applications is, uh, here's an example, there is a robotic navigation. So we've developed a navigation system that works directly on these spikes. The way this works is there's a camera looking up at the ceiling. Almost all rooms have some structure on their ceiling. So when the robot is driving around, we're getting events from the structure on the ceiling. So if I'm, if I'm, if I'm the camera and I'm looking up, I see, oh, there's some structure, I get events from over there. And I can use a particle filter approach where with every new incoming event, I can do two things in parallel. I can increase my certainty of where I am in the world tracking multiple hypotheses of where I could be. And at the same time, I can use that event to update my knowledge of the world, to update my map. So it's a, it's a two process uh, system that for every single event does two, the events in red, uh, does two steps shown in, in orange. Uh, they are both very simple computation elements. So, so we do very um, small computation per incoming event. But as we're getting many events, 100,000 events, we incrementally build up certainty of where we are with the robot. So we can run this as a small robot navigation experiment shown here at the video at the bottom. There's a little robot bouncing around in a wall. So when, whenever it bounces at a wall, it uh, goes in a different direction. And at the bottom right, you see that there's a map created um, from looking up at the ceiling with a structure that's visible on the ceiling. And the robot keeps track of its own path. So this is a a potential solution is a demonstration of how the so-called uh, simultaneously localization and mapping SLAM problem works. SLAM in principle has been solved 15 years back, 20 years back by uh, people like Sebastian Trun for robots. There have been museum robots going around in the world. The drawback of these solved systems, these uh, existing systems, is that they need large computing power to solve the problem. Now here we are doing this mapping problem on board of a small microcontroller. So instead of using a giant computer, a desktop computer, we use a microcontroller with vision input. And the only reason why we can be efficient is because we have used the event-based, the spiking nature of the data input so that we can use efficient computation on board of these systems. That's why things work in real time on small mobile robots. Here's a different project that we've started some years ago at TUM. It's a stereo vision. Again, you've seen examples of stereo vision a few minutes ago. Uh, we use a portable system, a head-mounted system with two event cameras, the bottom right. We merge information from the two cameras to compute distance to objects. And we want to convey the perceived 3D uh, uh, structure of the world to visually impaired people, to help people, blind people, visually impaired people, to navigate safely. This does not mean that our system says, oh, there's a laptop and there's a white dongle to convert videos. But it will say, oh, there's an obstacle here, there's open space there, there's open space here, which is the most important information that blind people need to safely navigate uh, in everyday environments. So here's an example of how this works. We have a left and a right incoming data stream from the event-based vision sensors. And because of disparity, because of position mismatch for every single pixel, for every single event coming in, we can compute distance to objects, which is color-coded uh, at, the, at the bottom diagram. So when we approach an, an, an artificially placed warning object, then uh, the system recognizes this is uh, very nearby and we have to issue a warning. I'm not going into much detail um, about how we do the 3D percept. There's a paper about this. The real problem is that we use an approach which um, computes uh, possible matches from events in one eye given the history of events in the other eye. So whenever I'm getting an event in, in one eye, I can match this with what I've seen before in the other eye. And again, over time, this builds up certainty which places belong to which together to form a 3D representation. This is event-based, but it's incredibly compute-intense. So for the paper, we've solved everything 
in theory, we've done um, a MATLAB implementation, and of course, MATLAB is really slow. But even in a, in a C or Java implementation, this does not work in real time for large amount of events and large uh, number of pixels. So that's a real problem, both for the objects, the, for, for the, um, the, the, the devices we want to build for real people, but also in general for any robotic settings, because robots work in real time. That's what we, ex we, we uh, see all the time. We have to move to real time computing. And that's a real problem now when we're getting to meaningful networks which are going beyond 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 neurons. We need larger networks. We have to worry about how to implement them in hardware so that they run in real time. And that's what I want to address in the second part of my presentation. So we, we leave this sensor part here with a the, with the take home message that we care about spiking computation from an engineering perspective as a very efficient way to represent data for technology. Now let's open up the second part, neuromorphic real-time computing and control, and see what we can do to instantiate such systems. We don't need sound here. This is a very simple robot. It's a, it has a few wheels to drive around. It's omnidirectional. It has a small gripper arm that can be used to pick up objects. And it has two event cameras on board. Actually, there's a third one on top of the, of the robot arm. We're not using that right now to, to sense the environment. And what you see there is an experiment where this robot picks up an object and places it somewhere else. Now, this seems trivial. And from a pure robotics perspective, people can argue, oh, we, we can code this. This is a day's work for an engineer to implement such a project. We followed a very different approach. We have trained the robot independently to use its wheels, to use its robotic arm to combine this to pick out the wrong object. What you don't see is these objects are blinking at certain frequencies. They all have individual frequencies. And what the robot uh, detected is that the frequencies are out of order. They're not in increasing or decreasing order. One of them is misplaced. So it finds the right one, decides how to get there, how to pick it up, how to coordinate the wheels and the arm and how to put the object so that from its own perspective, from its point of view, this is aligned properly. So instead of programming the task, we have demonstrated by training, by experimenting, uh, how to solve the task. We give, we've given examples of how to move, how to grasp, how to uh, perceive the blinking frequencies. We've given examples of good orders and bad orders, and the neural network has itself identified what to do and how to combine the available actuation, the wheels and the robotic arm, to solve the task properly. So this is a, a larger neural network setting, which again, we've published so you can read up the details. The point I want to address here is that, yes, we can solve seemingly complex problems. It's not obvious how to combine wheels and a robotic arm to reach out to targets over there. For me, it's, 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 I don't even have to think about when I want to unplug this device. I will not start to bend over and reach. I know I have to first walk and then pick it up. For, for a robotic system, this is by no means trivial. It has to encounter this. It has to learn this itself. So this is what I mean. We can solve non-trivial tasks by neural systems. But if we want to do so, we have to follow these three different, um, we have to address these three different aspects on top. One is we need an algorithm to do it. We need, we need to describe a neural network or learning system to, to, to uh, learn what and how to do. We need some computing instance. This can be my desktop computer. This can be a supercomputer. This can be a neural computer. And we need the real world systems. We need sensors, actuators, and robots to perform the task. So here you see all this combined. But as soon as we go to the real world, then you face problems of real time, of energy um, consumption, of achievable complexity. How much can we do so that we stay in real time or in energy constraints? And very quickly, we will see that systems we describe, interesting neural networks, cannot run in real time on standard computers anymore, and not even on GPU cards, and hardly or not anymore on supercomputers. They're all meant to run offline uh, in the night. So then we can look into dedicated hardware for neural computing. And this is an overview of typical existing systems. It's, it's a bit outdated. There's no Loihi on board. Um, 
But what you see from left to right is from uh, most generic to most specific computing systems. So of course your, your laptop or your, your CPU is a neural computer. It's Turing complete. You can compute anything you want. It's just not efficient in computing neural networks. That's the problem we have with this von Neumann architecture, which consecutively executes instruction by instruction with a separate dedicated memory uh, for data and programs. There's a neural computer called the Spinnaker system. I will talk much more about that. It's basically a network of many very small CPUs that is distributed with a communication bus that is very efficient for neural spikes, for neural communication. So I'll talk more about this on the next slide. It's a general purpose computer. It's a microcontroller based system. The next one third here is True North. It's a development by uh, IBM and to some way it's the same as Loihi. Loihi is a bit more complex by Intel. True North is dedicated digital hardware to implement neural functionality. So inside the True North chip, there is circuitry that collects incoming spikes integrates up or sums up, it's a time discrete system, sums up, and once there's a threshold reached, it will send an output spike. That's all it does. You cannot program anything else in that because by hardware, this is what it does. What you can do is you can uh, change the connectivity of where spikes go. So that's the way you can program this neuromorphic hardware, the True North chip, saying this is how you should root spikes, this is where they go. It's more efficient for neural networks, but it's very much limited to this one particular function. If I want a different neural model, a more complex neural model than leaky integrate and fire, I'm lost because in hardware, that's what is there and that's what can be computed. Spikey is even one more step towards um, real neural computation in the sense that from instead of digital systems, this is going to an analog internal computation. So it's the same um, idea. There's dedicated hardware for neural computation, but it's an analog system that integrates incoming um, spikes. And once the threshold is reached, it sends an output spike. Again, we can reconfigure connectivity and weights, um, but the computation is even more limited in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the, the process that's happening at the neuron. It's much more uh, uh, contaminated by noise uh, because it's an analog system but it's more energy efficient. So it, in, in principle, this scales up um, better, uh, more, uh, more efficient. So we use the Spinnaker system a lot in our lab. That's just an overview of existing systems. There are a few more. We use the Spinnaker system a lot because it offers um, sufficient flexibility to implement any neural model you like. It's, program it's completely programmable, yet it allows to scale up large. There are very large Spinnaker systems available. So when I talk about the Spinnaker system, what has been developed at the University of Manchester in the last decade about is um, a networked infrastructure of individual processors or computing units. Each processor is shown at the bottom right where we have a computing system with dedicated processing and dedicated local program and data storage. So there is no delay in fetching instructions. But the core reason why this is considered a neuromorphic computer is the interprocess communication, which is the red block in the center. There's a router that allows to talk to other processors on chip, but mainly to processors far elsewhere in the system, sending spikes asynchronously from one source to many targets. So this is very different to my computer memory here, where I can easily write at one location and then read back but I cannot simultaneously write at many, many, many locations. I have to do it cons consecutively. Or where the memory, the shared memory here between the four, five, and 10 cores is, uh, uh, is the bottleneck when distributing data. So here we have the asynchronous router, which is designed to emit spikes from one source. So when one neuron spikes, it will go to many, many, many targets uh, instantaneously within um, sufficiently short time so that the overall system allows connectivity um, between all these distributed neurons. There are 
individual computing boards available. Top left, this is one instance of a Spinnaker computing board with about 50 chips, about uh, 16 usable cores. So we're getting, let's say, almost 1,000 computing cores per board. Computing core can time multiplex maybe 50 neurons. So per board, we can compute something like uh, 50,000 neurons. In Manchester, they have a very large number of these boards stacked in a computer rack where ultimately the goal is to build one million cores. Again, a core can compute about 50 neurons in real time, depending on the complexity of the model. So it would be about 50 million neurons that can be simulated in real time. That's a pretty big number. So if you can run large neural networks in real time, that's great. But then the machine is in Manchester, and that's very difficult for the people who want to carry around their mobile device or who want to do robotic experiments in our lab. So what we focus on is smaller systems where we have standalone units, as shown on the right. There's one Spinnaker chip with a number of cores. We can stack on top of that a few more, but we have this running in real time uh, to process spiking inputs and generate spiking motor outputs. So one project we are um, excited about is um, event-based processing of um, electro-muscle um, stimulation signals. So you can uh, use EMG recordings. We are not clinical people, but we have data sets from EMG recordings that we can feed in as spiking signals into a spiking neural network operating on dedicated hardware so that we can pull out, we can extract um, the desired motion for example, to control neuroprosthetic devices to help restore functionality of lost limbs, arms, or legs. You'll see some more about this later, but that's the long-term vision. We would like to run spiking neural networks on spiking-enabled, spiking-efficient hardware so that we can uh, decode neural signals in real time. Now, the steps towards that, as an example, we have uh, used a, a mobile robot. We have used a Spinnaker board on the robot, you see this collect co combined on the right. We have used an interface board to talk uh, from Spinnaker to the robot and some event-based vision sensors. And here are examples, again, of what we do in spiking systems. So we have this, this robot with onboard neural computer um, is doing uh, tasks like optic flow computation. On the bottom left, you see the robot has two lateral facing sensors. It's going along a hallway with black and white patterns on the wall. Uh, we see event-based vision input recorded, and uh, there's a spiking network on board of the robot computing optic flow, shown in the, in the right two windows, the bottom left, so that we can use the perceived optic flow to center the robot in the hallway. There's another experiment uh, doing distance estimation uh, with a robot. Um, so these are simple examples of how we can use spiking neural networks in real time for robot control. Now, and once more, the vision where we want to go is shown in these uh, videos, and I think this is a very impressive video. Uh, this is showing how people walk. So I don't recommend, I don't think we all walk like this. I don't recommend you should walk like this, but this is how people can walk. Next to it, you see how robots these days walk. And that's very embarrassing for uh, some of us in here who say we are robot researchers. Of course, there are better examples of how robots walk, but this is, uh, this is pretty much uh, state of the art some years back. Um, oh, and the difference is not this is 2015, this is 2016. It's not that humans have developed in one year these skills. Uh, you, you see me walking all the time. This is what I can do. Well, thank you. No, no, I can, I'll, I'll come upstairs. So um, you see there is a big problem, there's a big difference between the two. Um, one of the main reasons for this is that all the robots you see on the right side are stiff. They have you know, gearboxes and, and electric motors that drive their actuators. Whereas we humans have compliant actuation. This, this, even if I hold my elbow stiff, this arm gives in. So it's, it's a non-perfect system, but this allows in interaction with the real world, in contact with the real world, to give in and to compensate for a lot of problems I've had otherwise. These robots can't do that. And that's why we are very interested in using um, simulated or physical instances of compliant systems to later, again, go to neuroprosthesis devices or to, to build um, robots that are safe to interact with humans. Your factory coworker should not be a robot like this 
that you know, falls or breaks your arm, but it should be a system that when you touch it, it gives in a bit. These systems are hard to control. Traditional control theory has no ways of compensating for all these errors and uncertainties and unknowns and uh, mechanical modifications over lifetime of compliant systems. So what we work towards is using neuronal controls, cerebellar-based models, as shown on the right, spiking neural systems for cerebellar fine-tuning of motor control to operate compliant systems. You might call them you know, badly designed robots, but they are intentionally compliant. They are giving in so that when you hold on to them, as you'll see later, it's physically compliant. It's not a software that senses and then changes the control to be software compliant. It's a physical compliant robotic system that we can control here in our relatively simple neural model. This is about 2,000 neurons for a single degree of freedom. The trick is if we have multiple degrees of freedom adjacent to each other, then whatever I do in my shoulder has an impact on what I have to do in my elbow, and what I do in shoulder plus elbow has an impact on what I have to do in my wrist. So the control problem is getting more and more and more difficult, which in neural terms means add more neurons. In theory, if we scale up to significantly larger systems, not 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000, but 100 or 500,000 or a few million, then we should be able to control many degrees, many connected degrees of freedom well. This is what we are working on. We are not there yet, but we can do quite well with one degree of freedom, or let's say two degrees on one joint. There are two actuators moving, um, and we are extending that system, and we want to use spiking networks in spiking neural computation for real time. So there is an, an area of uh, um, the Human Brain Project um, called Physical Neurorobotics, so we work on the task of going from simulator to real-world robots. You've seen many real-world robots. I was hoping Fabrice talks about the neural simulator, but he's only talking about uh, spiking neurons. So this is an infrastructure that allows to simulate complicated, intricate uh, robots and connect them to virtual brains. Now, we do the same. We build uh, models of robots, for example, the robot mouse. We build physical instances of these robots and connect them to brains. And again, these brains can be simulated in computers, or these brains can be uh, neuromorphic chips. So here's an example of the Spinnaker 2 chip that we've received from Dresden. That's a redesign of the Spinnaker system with a today's technology. So we start running uh, the complexity of one of the big boards that you've seen earlier inside one of the chips. So now we have two of the big boards uh, talking of more than 100,000 neurons in real time that we can uh, compute on here, and we put these inside the mouse robot so that we can use the event-based vision as input and perform some meaningful tasks. A different example, and now we're going again back to uh, work in Karlsruhe, is about robotic arms reaching and grasping. So we have some real-world settings where we uh, explore uh, unknown objects. So there's a pickup phase where a robot arm is supposed to grab objects interact with these objects, for example, shake them. And based on the difference from expected behavior and compliant arms to real behavior when I'm holding this object, I can infer physical properties of these objects. So for example, if it's heavy or lightweight, or if there is a liquid inside which then shakes and behaves very differently compared to solid bodies. So these are questions we investigate. How can neural networks um, identify such objects and then meaningfully act with them. For example, toss them in a bin. Uh, this is the last slide I have. So this is an overview of why we care about neural uh, computation in real-world robotics. So uh, we want to implement uh, neural algorithms in real time so that we can uh, create motor output in real time and therefore have in, uh, systems acting intelligently in the real world. So that's the research agenda. Um, this is our web pages. And again, some uh, figures of how we think we combine brains through theory or brains through physical instantiation with robotic systems. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you.